My name is Marie Claire, and I'm going to be your host for today's Kumi Now online session. I first came to Zabil, Jerusalem in 2015, so it's a real privilege to be with all of you today. So today's session, we're going to focus on how Israel restricts the movement of Palestinians within their own land. Before we get started, I'd like to remind you that this session is being broadcast live on YouTube. If you do not wish to appear, please turn off your video feed. We would also love it if you could quickly share one of the links in the chat so that others may join our session. We're now inviting people from the audience to tell us how you have been applying Kumi Now back in your own community or are otherwise advocating for Palestine. If you have an idea or a project you'd like to share for up to five minutes in a future meeting, please email us at kumi at kuminow.com. It's now time for our weekly activism survey. Mark, could you launch the poll? We're gonna give you a few seconds to fill this out before we continue with our program. Great, I see lots of answers coming in, which is wonderful. This is really helpful for us and the, and the rest of the Kumi team. Um, as, uh, as you're filling out the, the poll, I'm gonna go ahead and continue with our program. So feel free to, free to keep uh, filling it out, but we'll continue um, with introducing everyone who you're going to see on today's session. So. Starting with Andreas, could you please introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Andraus Jahshan, and uh, I am from the old city of Jerusalem. And I started working here in Sabil three years ago. Great. Denise, would you mind introducing yourself? I think you're on me mute. Oh. Hey, the host, it's your problem. You have to. Thanks, okay, Denise. now, yes. Uh, Denise Asad, a storyteller, Palestinian storyteller from Caesarea, the ruined um, um, village uh, in the beach. And um, I am living now in Haifa. Holding, I am a Palestinian holding an Israeli passport. Great, it's a pleasure to have you with us today. Tartil, would you introduce yourself, please? Hello, everyone. It's Tartil Al Junaidi from Hebron, Palestine, and I am a field team member at CBT Palestine since 2019. Thank you. We're really looking forward to hearing from you today. We're going to now hear our updates from what's going on in Palestine. Andreas, can you take it away for us? Yes. So for the updates on the ground is as follows. Israeli settlers vandalized the electronic panel that controls the water supply to the village of Asir al qibli of the northern West Bank city of Nablus. Hassan Berlas, an official who monitors Israeli colonial settlement activity in the northern West Bank, said that settlers from the illegal Israeli settlement of Yatsar sneaked to the village and vandalized the electronic panel of a water tank that supplies water to the whole village. The number of new coronavirus cases in the West Bank continue to rise today and reach 1,626 in the last 24 hours, while 14 patients have died, according to the Minister of Health, Mike Kelly. 
At the same time, 725 patients have recovered in the West Bank. She said in her daily report on cor in coronavirus in Palestine that Gaza scored 98 new corona cases and two deaths in the last 24 hours, along with 83 recoveries. No data was available from East Jerusalem. The surge in new cases, the number of critically ill corona patients are getting treatment in intensive care has also increased and reached 116, including 29 who are in respiratories, said the health minister. The Israeli occupation authorities detained at least 20 Palestinians, including a father and his son and siblings in raids at their homes throughout the occupied territories, according to various Palestinian sources. They said soldiers detained at least seven Palestinians in occupied East Jerusalem and surrounding areas, including two brothers from the town of Hizma, northeast of Jerusalem, and a 15-year-old boy from a Sawiyi neighborhood of Jerusalem. In the Hebron district in the south of the West Bank, soldiers detained a father and his son in the village of Beit Kahil, northwest of Hebron, after raiding and uh, ransacking their home. In the north of the West Bank, soldiers raided various areas in the Jenin district and detained at least five people, including two siblings aged 17 and 20, according to the Palestinian Prisoner Society Office in Jenin. A Palestinian youth who suffers from, from hemophilia was tortured during integration at the infamous Israeli detention center in West Jerusalem, known as the Russian compound, today said the Palestinian Prisoner Society, PPS. Qasem Baghdadi, 20, from al Amari refugee camp in Ramallah, told PPS that while he was held at the Russian compound for two days, was beaten on the limbs and suffered bleeding in the knees. Baghdadi was detained for 21 days, most of which he spent at orphan military de and detention camp near Ramallah. During this time, he was transferred three times to hospitals in Israel following a, det a deterioration in his health. The Israeli military court ordered to release Baghdadi last night on a 2,100 Israeli shekel bail and was immediately taken to hospital in Ramallah. The Israeli municipality of West Jerusalem today demolished a two-story house owned by Hatim Abu Mayyali in the East Jerusalem neighborhood of Isawi, according to a local activist. This is the fourth time the Abu Mayyali house is being demolished for construction without a permit. Abul Hummus, head of the Isawi Residence Follow-up Committee, said that a large Israeli occupation force cordoned off the area while the house is located where the house is located as a bulldozer proceeded to tear down the Abu Mayyali building. The owner of the house suffers from paraplegia paralysis caused in 2009 when he fell and broke his spine during one of the times the municipality was demolishing his house. An Israeli military court today sentenced former lawmaker and political leader Khaled, Khalida Jarrar to two years in prison and 12 months suspended for five years and fined her around $1,200. Jarrar, 58, a senior leader in the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, PFLP, was detained at the end of October 2019 for her role in the PFLP and held in, in administrative detention since then without charge or trial and based on secret evidence not available for even her lawyer. Gerard was detained in 2015 and 2017 and held in administrative detention before her re-detention in October 2018. And that's for the updates on the ground for today. Thank you so much, Andreas. I'd now like to turn things over to Denise Assad, our wonderful storyteller, who will be telling us a story that relates to today's issues. Thank you. I am so happy to be with you week after week. Today I will tell, I think it's a Sufi story that my father used to tell me. Um, there is a story about me that I think now I, I was talking too much. Not, something in my mouth, and my father really um, discovered a great way to make me silent, is to tell me a story. He was a storyteller in his soul. He was a headmaster, but uh, 
from him I get this um, really wonderful gift to be a storyteller. So once upon a time, there was a king, but he was so different from all the kings and, and the leaders that, in, that we knew and that we know now those days. He ruled his people with justice and they lived in secure and safe country. He had two sons and one daughter. One day he felt very sick and he called for his doctor and the doctor told him, you have really few months to live. I am very sorry, my Lord. The king was really very, very wise. He called for his two sons and daughter and told him about the bad news. They were very, very sorry because they love their father and they want him to live like all of us forever. So they say, we will really pray for you. We, want, we don't want you to leave us. He say, that is life. We all will go to this, this way. But he told them, I want to know before I will leave this life. I want to know who will be the king or the queen after him. Okay, ask us what you want us to do. He said, you know this lar largest hall in the palace? Yes, we do. I ask you, I will give the, my kingdom to the one of you who will fill this largest hall, no matter with what, but it has to be totally full. Okay, we will do it. The first prince went with his horse all over the kingdom, west, east, north, south. He searched for people to give him advice how he can fill this huge hall. He asked the researcher, he asked the leaders, he asked the wise people, and they told him what to do. He had to collect all the wheat all over the kingdom and all the camels to put the all the wheat in sacks to put it on the camels and it will fill the hole. It was no problem. He is the prince, he can go anywhere, ask for the wheat, ask for the camels. And he did it for seven days and nights. He was collecting all the wheat. He came back to the palace, asked the servant to help him load in the wheat to the hole. Three days they worked really hard. There was no weeds, but half of the hall was still empty. He was very upset. But there's no way it was the, what his father asked to fill it. Absolutely. The youngest prince went in his horse all over the kingdom, east, west, north, south. He asked for an advice from all the people all around. And they told him, you have to collect all the straw and the, all the farm, farm animals and put the straw in sacks and lead them with the animals to your father's palace. And that's what he did. And nobody can stop him. He's the prince. He came back after two weeks. He asked the servants, the soldiers, to help him load, load in the straw to the hole. They worked hard for three days and three nights. There was no straw, but when he looked in the hole, there was like half a meter of the hole still empty. He was really upset because he really hoped to be the king after his father. But there is nothing to do. The king was watching what they did, and he noticed that the princess, his daughter, wasn't there. He called for her and he said, you have no plan to fill in the, the hall. What you are doing? Said, I was hearing tales. I was watching the butterflies, watering the flowers, and I had a great plan. She went to this huge hall, asked the soldier to 
closed the curtains all around and it was really dark. She brought, brought four candles, put everyone in one corner and she lit it, lit the candles and the hall was full with light, totally full with light. The king was very happy and she became the queen after her father. حكايتي حكايتها وبقلوبكم خبيتها ويريت تحبوها زي ما انا حبيتها. I told you my story and put it in your heart. I hope you will like it as I do. Happy dreams, happy stories for all of you. Thank you, Sabine. Thanks so much for your beautiful story, Denise. Thank you. We're now going to turn to our main issue of the week and our special guest. As she speaks, if you think of a question, please type it into the chat and I will try and ask as many of them as possible when we get to our question and answer period. Tartil, please take it away. Thank you, Mary. Um, first of all, I would like to thank everyone uh, who came here today and joined us. Um, so it's Tartil from Christian Beastmaker Team organization. Um, I'm not sure if everyone is familiar with the organization or not, but I will go for a small introduction. And if you have been uh, or ha know about CBT, uh, please let us know in the chat box. That would be uh, really interesting to know how do you know about CBT. Um, let me share screen. All right. So all right, so let me. Um, so Christian Peacemaker Teens is a faith-based organization and they support nonviolence grassroots resistance. Uh, we work through accompany the local partners and we follow their needs. Uh, we, we do like observing and documenting and for sure advocacy is a huge part of our work. Um, and here is uh, our website, and uh, I'm pretty sure uh, the Kumina team will uh, will send it. Um, we have also CBT have uh, several teams uh, in different area in the world. Uh, we have Asian Migrant Solidarity in Lesbos, um, Turtle Island in Canada, uh, Colombia, Iraqi Kurdistan and finally Palestine. Um, by the way, uh, CBT is launching 35 years of action. So each month uh, a field team will be talking about an issue, an issue that's happening in their team. So you can uh, check CBT social media and website to know more about each team. But for now, let's talk about CBT uh, Palestine team. Uh, it's uh, the oldest uh, program in uh, among CBT program. It was um, we were invited by the local community to have a team in Hebron, uh, in the old city of Hebron, in 1995. Um, so it's been 25 years here. Um, so what do we do in uh, Hebron, in uh, Palestine? First of all, we document human rights violation, and that comes through uh, the daily accompaniment that we do, and uh, several patrols that we do during the day uh, in the old city and edge uh, to area. And finally, the on-call system is uh, we provide uh, the local of our numbers uh, so they can call us. Uh, so they call us when there is an uh, emergency or incident like settlers attack, uh, home invasion, or arrest. And they will call us either to accompany them um, or uh, to report on uh, the incident. Uh, especially during COVID, we were not always able to be there uh, physically However, we were always in contact with uh, the community. So Tartil, sorry to interrupt. 
Would you mind changing your PowerPoint to slideshow mode just so that we can all see the words a little more clearly? All right. Okay. Let me let me check. I don't think I have it. It's in the Google Drive, so it's not oh, a PowerPoint. That's all right. Then we'll just continue not to worry. Um, I'll try to. Okay. I hope that more clear. That's yeah, that's great. Thank you. No worries. Okay. Um, so sec the second thing is advocacy. We do uh, uh, two reports a year. Uh, which are the school semester report. Every semester we do a school uh, report. Um, we have also the monthly newsletter that will have several articles uh, and photo essay. Uh, finally, we are uh, active, really active on our social media. Um, the second thing is uh, delegations and we do several presentations for groups. And that was uh, before uh, the COVID-19. And now we are more focusing on webinars. And finally is monitoring the checkpoints. So as we are today, we are talking about the checkpoints. Let's talk more about the checkpoints. Um, so as I believe most of the audience know, uh, the edge one edge two area in the front. Um, so and that it was divided after the Ibrahimi massacre. Um, so edge two, it's the white area you can see here. It's uh, 14 kilometers. And if you can see the this bordered uh, line, uh, it we call it the restricted area of uh, edge two. Uh, which means uh, it's uh, the area where a compound of settlement there. And there is only in that area, the restricted area, there is uh, around 121 obstacles. And among them, there is 21 permanent checkpoints. Um, so uh, what do we do at the checkpoint? If you work at the checkpoint, uh, because we monitor uh, several schools. Uh, we monitor the children and students passing the checkpoints. So uh, if you can see here, um, we mainly monitor uh, 11 schools and three kindergartens. Um, so here is a, a Salimic checkpoint and a Barisha checkpoint. Mainly, these are the two checkpoints that we monitor. Um, and we have like almost every day school, we, every school day, we will be um, at the checkpoints monitoring the children and teachers passing the checkpoints. Also, there is another two, two checkpoints, uh, which one is uh, here. Um, it's uh, near the Ziad School. It's uh, a school for boys. We have um, uh, a temporary uh, presence, depend, depending on our capacity and uh, the local uh, needs. And also, there is another school here in Tallinnimede called Kultuba School. Um, so um, it's, it's, it's in uh, Tallinnimede, and there is it's like directly next to a checkpoint called um, called 55 uh, checkpoint. Um, so we also present there depending on the local needs and our capacities. Um, so I will uh, show you this uh, short uh, film that my mates did um, uh, about our presence at the checkpoint. So yeah, there is, there is it. مرحبا احنا متطوعين مع السي بي تي كريستيان بيس ميكر احنا اللي متواجدين على حاجز السلايمه المتواجد في المنطقه الجنوبيه في مدينه الحليب ولا تصنف هاي المنطقه على انها منطقه اتش 2 
كان هون لمراقبة وتأكد من سلامة مولود طلاب المدارس ولتوثيق انتهاكات جنود الاحتلال اللي بتعرق هذه المسيرة الدراسية بالميقات اللي بتفاجئنا انه احنا بعض الاحيان الجنود الاحتلال بيمنعوا الناس اللي هم برا سكان البلدة القديمة انهم يعدوا من خلال الحواجز واحنا المكتب المتواجد عندنا في في البلدة القديمة فاحنا بنضطر ناخذ المسافة او الطريق الطويل اللي بتعدى فوق ال 6 كيلومتر تقريبا حتى نوصل للحواجز ونأدي مهامنا، في في حين انه احنا بنقدر نوصل لهي الحواجز من 10 ل 15 دقيقة، بس التاكسي والطريق الطويل باخذ منا حوالي تقريبا من 20 ل 40 دقيقة. بالعادة ما كنت انزل كثير على البلدة القديمة او على الحواجز. لانه بحس بالخطر وما بحس في امان بهي المناطق، بس بعد تطوع مع السي في تي قدرت اسيطر شوي على هذا الخوف واتغلب على مشكله الحواجز. انه انا وعمري 21 سنه ولسه عندي هاي الخوف والرهبه من المرور من الحواجز العسكريه، فكيف طلاب المدارس اللي دائما بمروا لمدارسهم من هاي الى ماكن؟ هذا الوضع وبهذا المكان ما في شيء اسمه حقوق انسان، يتم انتهاك حقوق الانسان وطلاب المدارس كل يوم وكل لحظه. احنا عندنا اثناء جنود الاحتلال حاليا متوجهين فوق الاسطح حتى يستفزوا الطلاب ويعينوا الاسلحه عليهم بحال صار اي شيء او حتى لمجرد تخويفهم. في حين انه طلاب المدارس بتعرضوا لتفتيش الحقائب، بتعرضوا لمواجهات، بتعرضوا لخوف، بتعرضوا للعديد من الامور اللي بتعرقل قدرتهم على التعلم ووصولهم للمدارس. نتمنى ينتهى الوضع وتتوقف انتهاكات حقوق الطفل نتمنى الطفل يقدر يروح على مدرسته بشكل آمن ومريح زيه زي أي طفل موجود بالعالم وبنتمنى يحصل على أبسط حقوق وهو حقه في التعليم وحقه في حرية الحركة So, um, thank you for watching and uh, that is uh, one of the, this, like what in general what you do at the checkpoints and how is the situation at the checkpoint um so there is several things that is happening at the checkpoint and we see there um students and teachers uh suffer from id check um bag check and um body search i will share with you a couple of testimonies from uh, uh, from our uh, like from students and teachers. So here is uh, Aya. Aya is uh, 16 years old. Uh, she from Al Fayhat School, which is inside the restricted area, and she has she has to pass through four checkpoints. Um, and uh, there's a situation happens a lot of not only with Aya. We hear we hear we hear it from a lot of students. Um, so a soldier asked her to have to give him his ID, but she's only 16, so she doesn't have one yet. Um, so she was accused of flying. So he ordered her to um, to empty everything she has in her bag, and after like just uh, detained her for like 10 minutes. Uh, he asked her to uh, to collect her stuff and leave. Another testimony from a female teacher from the same school. Um, she was getting back search, um, and she saw the soldier put uh, trying to plant a knife in in her purse. So she stopped him and yelling that she saw him. Um, and that is a situation that happened for a uh, couple of years uh, and that that led to arrest and even the killing. Um, finally, we have a male teacher from Al Khalil School. Um, he, he is describing what he likes to be body searched. He's just saying that it's humiliating and if uh, when a child and a student sees his teacher having no power at all at the checkpoint, he will start wondering why does he have power inside the school on us. So, um, so that's uh, just like see how checkpoints are really injustice and um, uh, like 
how they are trying to uh, tighten up um, the lives of the people who live there in H2 area, mainly in H2 area. Um, also, um, one of the uh, things that the Israeli army used uh, is uh, the collective punishment. So as you see, as you saw in the previous video, um, the soldier will be, should be inside the checkpoint. However, uh, most of the time, you will see them um, either in the intersection where the kids uh, go to school or in, on the roof. Um, so that is really provocative for the kids. So uh, sometimes there will be a stone throwing at the soldiers or at the checkpoint. So the army, the Israeli army uh, response, there will be a few. One is use of chorus. They will either use stun grenades, uh, tear gas in an area is full of schools and full of uh, houses there. Um, sometimes the tear gas will get inside, uh, inside the houses or even inside the school. And it's really distributing for the educational process. Um, and the other thing that they will use if they did not use for is they will close the checkpoint. Um, they will not allow anyone who wants to enter or to um, to get out from the from the checkpoint, where is the restricted area of H two. They will be allowed to, to um, either enter or exit, um, and they will tell the community either you will stop them from throwing stones or um, no one will get out from here or get in. And there is also a video that I'll show you um, um, that show you what is uh, happening at one of the checkpoints, uh, Kitun. And it, ha it happens a lot, no, sometimes not on that checkpoint, sometimes on like other checkpoints. It's the area of security. It's also an area where children walk to school. Uh, excuse me, the, the little one can go to the school safely and go and come back safely. Excuse me, these are children. These are children.
So this is a situation that uh, happened several times uh, in the semester uh, at the checkpoint. And it's really disputing for the kids and for the educational process in general. Um, so uh, among this, I would like to speak on another thing, which is um, how vehicles could enter to the restricted area. It's only adhering, uh, uh, it's only through one, uh, one gate which is a Salima checkpoint, which is uh, this, uh, this gate. Um, according to UN OCHA, 6,200 people reported that they cannot reach their houses with vehicles. So as you can see, here is this um, uh, the, the checkpoint, uh, a Salima checkpoint. Um, so <coughs> So if a vehicle has to go in, they, they first of all, they have to have a, a permission. Um, and it's not easy to have a permission uh, to get inside. Um, so to get a permission, you have to submit a request for the civil administration or for, um, or for, uh, or like the DCO. The Israeli DCO, and that's not an easy process. Sometimes it will take weeks, months, maybe years. In some cases, you might not get it, only because sometimes or once you got in a fight with a soldier at the checkpoint. So probably you won't get a permission for your car to enter the checkpoint and park it next to your ho next to your house. So you have just to walk all the way from the checkpoints to wherever your house is in. And there is no uh, exception. Like, like in winter, I will show you um, another, um, another, the another checkpoint, checkpoint Ketun. Um, so as you can see, uh, here is Kitun checkpoint, and even the cars can't go like close to the checkpoint. It's only they get in. So like you can't even get your children uh, to the safest area away from rain. Um, you only uh, drive to that point. You are not allowed it to to be uh, any more closer. Also. <coughs> I think that I would like to talk about that an incident that happened with us um, last October in 2020 uh, while we monitored the school. Um, there was uh, there was this man um, who is uh, a driver, and he um, he was negotiating uh, with the soldiers of trying to convince him to let him in with the car because he is carrying a lady with a special needs who can't walk. Um, so he was going to convince her, convince him to let them in. And he was telling him that they don't he doesn't live here, but she is uh, on a visit for someone here. However, the soldier insisted that he cannot let him in. Uh, and it's only for a couple of um, cars and vehicles, and their numbers are written are written on uh, on a paper. So um, we saw the driver. He parked outside the checkpoint, and he carried the lady with his hand, and he entered to the checkpoint, and had to walk with her all the way to where she wanted to go, and then he had to come back, and then go back like to his car after he gets out he got out from the uh <coughs> from the checkpoint um another incident i would like to talk about is 
let me share screen again. Um, there we go. Also, it happened on this checkpoint, which is a Salami checkpoint. As you can see, um, here is uh, these two gates, like the vehicle gate and the passenger's gate. These two gates are for basin for uh, our electric control. So uh, I think it was last month in February, uh, the power went off the checkpoint. So it was sadly, but the kids were really happy that the power went off because that day, they, there is like another gate here. It's a manual gate. So it was open that day. And everyone, every passenger, he, they had uh, to go through this gate um, without getting checked. And like, honestly, no one at that day got checked. And I think that's just a proof that getting checked at the checkpoint is not a security point. It's, uh, it's a matter of trying to tighten up the lives of the people there. Um, so, so I think the, everyone passed that day. However, vehicles and cars could not pass because this is the only place where cars can, can pass, can get in or get out of the restricted area. So <clears throat> that day, um, they either the they have to uh, get their cars uh, parked in their houses or outside the checkpoints and enter or exit uh, by walking, not using their cars. So this is um, this this happened in February, as I said. So this is this happens while we. Um, monitor the school. We also do monitor um, like um, let me, we also do monitor um, <coughs> uh, like Jewish holiday if there was because there will be like several uh, sometimes several attacks on the Palestinian neighborhood and um, so on some uh, Jewish holiday, not all of them, the main gate for the uh, edge to restricted area, um, it will be closed. Uh, some of you might be familiar with it. Let me share screen again. Um, and this is uh, the gate. So if this gate is closed, which is we call it the Ibrahimimos checkpoint um, during the it's closed during the Jewish holiday. So if this uh, checkpoint is closed, the kids or students who have their school inside that area or have to walk through this area to go to their jobs, the schools, or whatever, they cannot. They either have to take uh, to skip that day or they have to take um, a taxi and go uh, the other road where uh, it, it takes around 20 to 40 minutes uh, with a car to go to their, where, to their school, while they only can go there in a 15 minutes or, or 10 minutes or maybe less. Um, <coughs> finally, I would like um, to share one thing, which is, some observation that we see while we monitor the checkpoints. As we monitor the checkpoints, um, we see many observations, like standing there for a couple of hours, you will definitely observe the stuff. And mostly it's related to oppression. Um, so we call this checkpoint is Abed checkpoint or Abed checkpoint. Um, so like that way is the gate where the Israeli and Jews go to the, um, the 
uh, the Jewish side of the uh, Ibrahimi Mosque. And this side is for Palestinians. Uh, and you will clear, clear, clearly, when you stand there, you will never see a settler walking here and uh, getting stopped by a, a, the Israeli a border police. No settlers will be stopped here. Only if you are going to that way, you will definitely get stopped. You will get ID check, body search sometimes, and back search. And you can see here, you can obviously see um, discrimination and racism at that checkpoint. And there is like always a lot to see at the checkpoint. Um, like uh, one thing that I I noticed, especially after uh, now we are a local team, full local team. Um, um, like while passing the checkpoint, you will see the difference when a, ma a Palestinian male gets to the checkpoint. You will see the difference when a hijabi, a girl with a hijab, um, um, get to the checkpoints, or the way a girl with no hijab gets to the checkpoints. You will definitely see um, the difference. A male, a male, uh, a male, um, a male, a male Palestinian will definitely get uh, body searched from a distance. We call it where they have to uh, raise their sleeves or um, like take off their jackets um, and uh, or to take off their belts. Uh, if I am a not not a girl with not not wearing a hijab, I will uh, sometimes sometimes not always I will get ID check and I will sometimes open my bag and they will check it. Um, and but when a girl with a hijab gets to the checkpoint, she will definitely uh, be will be checked like her pocket, and uh, she will have to empty everything she has on the table at the checkpoint. Um, and it's always there is more to say about checkpoints. There is always a lot of things you see at the checkpoint. Um, but for time's sake uh, and for uh, the Q and the Q and A session, I would like to uh, to finish here now. And uh, I would like to thank you all for listening and uh, being here with uh, us. And yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you so much for that wonderful and very informative presentation. We have quite a few questions coming in. So um, in the time we have left, I'll ask as, as many as we can get through. The first question is, are the videos you show today available on the CPT website? Uh, okay. Yeah, uh, definitely. And you can see it on, some of them were on CPT international social media and um, some are on uh, CBT Palestine social media. So uh, if you have access for uh, CBT uh, Facebook, you will definitely uh, see that these videos. Thank you. Um, the next question, you've already touched on this a little bit, but the next question is, do you also receive harassment from the soldiers when you go through the checkpoint? Um, well, definitely. Even when the team was uh, like mostly international, we used to have uh, our ID check. Uh, sometimes they will uh, take a photo from uh, the passport, um, the password uh, or my ID, for example. Uh, but uh, you will definitely see that the harassment are increased when it's a full local team. Thank you. Um, 
With all the restrictions we're facing on international tra travel, what special challenges is CPT facing in its staffing operations in Hebron? Um, um, let's see. In 2018, there was six full-time CPT uh, international, uh, and they were denied entry um, wow. for like five years, I guess. Some of them were more, some less. Uh, but until now, these six could not made it back to uh, Palestine. Uh, so it's really um, it's really hard for internationals when they want to come to Palestine to serve as CBT Palestine team uh, because it's um, we have always make we have, like they have always make um, a cover up the story like why they are coming here. Um, and it's always they are afraid of being denied entry. And that is uh, sometimes un like encouraging, not like discouraging for, um, for internationals to serve in Palestine team. Thank you. Um, has the COVID vaccine been made available in Hebron? Uh, definitely not. <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> and um, I think last month in February, and uh, the the Palestinian Authority got the first uh in group of vaccine, and it was um, uh, it was first for the security section and the medical uh staff, and not all of them I guess got the vaccine. Um, so yeah. Thank you. The next question is, how do parents prepare their children to go through the checkpoint? Um, like, it's, it's not like how we imagine it or people who doesn't live there imagine it. When you live there, you live in the area where next to your house is, is a checkpoint. Somehow you are already prepared for that. Sadly, it's, it's, it's really the checkpoint is normalized. Um, however, not for everyone. Like, um, so, like, the kids know that they have to pass the checkpoint, but they always feel the fear that, um, that they will get arrested or something that will happen with the soldiers. Um, so um, like for the little kids, the parents usually uh, walk with them till uh, inside the checkpoint till they pass and they start waving for them from outside the checkpoint uh, till like they see them uh, like, for example, going to the bus or halas walking to the way uh, to their schools. Um, or for if, if their cars, they have vehicles, they will, uh, and they, they have a permission, they will go with them and um, uh, like deliver them to, to there. And also another point um, is how teachers also uh, like, kind of warn uh, the children, uh, for example, don't hold any, um, any knife or anything uh, might be uh, suspicious for the soldier that might get you in trouble, even if it was a school material. Thank you. Um, I just want to say thank you to everyone um, for putting such great questions in the chat and thank you Tartil for such an informative presentation um, and responses to those questions. Unfortunately, we don't have time to answer every question today. Um, but I would like you to point you point you to our Kumi entry and action for the way for the week and links that will be shared in the chat for more information. We're going to move on to talking about our Kumi action for this week. This week, every time you go through a door or cross a street, wait a minute to try to better understand what it is like to not have freedom of movement like many Palestinians. If walking with someone 
share the why behind your waiting. Checkpoints prevent many Palestinians from freely moving around. Write about the importance of freedom of movement on social media alongside a picture of one of the military checkpoints. Include a link to this page of the Kumi Now website along with the hashtags, hashtag human rights, hashtag human, Kumi Now, and hashtag Kumi Nine. I'd like to give Tartil the opportunity to chime in. Um, do you have any other thoughts about the Kumi action or other ways that people can promote um, Christian peacemaker teams in Palestine? Um, I would like to thank you for challenging yourself and wanting to learn what you were not taught. Uh, so please keep up this challenge going and challenge your community, challenge your friends to learn what they don't see in the media. And I would like to take this chance to invite people and folks to follow CBC social media website and uh, please in signing up for uh, CBC Palestine mailing list. And I would like to thank everyone here and yeah. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today. A link to a video of this gathering, along with all the links shared today, will be available on the Kumi Now website and on YouTube in a day or so. And it will also be shared in our next newsletter. You can subscribe to Kumi Now on YouTube and subscribe to our newsletter to make sure you receive them. We would greatly appreciate it if you shared this amazing session with your friends and colleagues, as well as information about our future sessions. Next week, we will be looking at the role that women play in peacemaking and how women are critical to ending the conflict in Palestine. If you'd like to be reminded of the online gatherings an hour before they begin, you can register for email reminders at kuminow.com online using the form at the bottom of the page. We hope to see you back here next week. Thanks again and good night.